Good afternoon, buenas tardes, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual afternoon with Ellen McGarrahan to discuss Two Truths and a Lie, a murder, a private investigator, and her search for justice. Ellen McGarrahan earned a degree in history from Yale and worked for a decade as an investigative reporter at newspapers in New York City, Miami, and San Francisco before accidentally finding her calling as a private detective. Two Truths and a Lie is her first book. Sarah Gerard will be in conversation with her today. Uh, she'll be moderating. And Sarah Gerard's essay collection, Sunshine State, was a New York Times editor's choice, a finalist for the Southern Book Prize, and was long listed for the Penn Diamondstein Spivogel Award for the Art of the Essay. Her novel, Binary Star, was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Art Seidenbaum Award for First Fiction and was a best book of the year at NPR, Vanity Fair, and BuzzFeed. Her novel, True Love, was a best book of 2020 at Glamour and Bustle and a winner of an Audiophile Earphones Award. Shondaland called it appalling and hilarious, surprisingly poignant. It's an extremely resonant social satire. We're so pleased to have them both with us today. I'll remind you that throughout this afternoon's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of Two Truths and a Lie from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you. Welcome, Sarah. Hello. Hi, Ellen. Hi, Sarah. Good to see you. Talking with you again today. Yep. I had um, the terrific pleasure of consuming your book again this week, finishing it this morning, just tearing through the final pages. And um, I sent you a little bit of a confession via email this morning. And I said, there are books that I just don't finish sometimes because I don't care enough about the ending, and but yours, I just sped right through it um, a second time today, and it's so elegant. And just huge congratulations to you, um, and I'm honored to be here celebrating with you today. So I wondered if you would uh, start us off with a reading that kind of introduces the situation. Okay. First of all, I want to say thank you for talking with me. And it's amazing to hear those incredibly kind words because I think your work is amazing. I love that. I feel the same way about Sunshine State. And I've been amazed by the by the depth and the beauty of your writing. So it's really a privilege. And I'm just very grateful. Um, so I thought with um, I thought I could read basically the very first pages of my book, which uh, essentially introduced the um, the story, in 1990, when I was a reporter for the Miami Herald, I was assigned uh, to witness an execution at Florida State Prison. Um, the, the, the condemned man was named Jesse Tafaro, and he'd been convicted of murdering two police officers in Broward County in 1976. And I opened the book where the story opens for me, which is at the prison that morning. Um, and it's just a short passage, but it's kind of what my introduction to the this entire story is. Um, it's, it's called Prologue Six Minutes Past Seven. The road out of town was narrow and dark, and I did not see the prison until it was right in front of me. 5.30 in the morning, Stark, Florida, May 1990. A bleak building, boxy, wrapped in razor wire and washed white by flares. I drove past the prison gates as instructed and pulled into a grass parking lot. The other reporters were already waiting, silhouettes in a mist floating up from the night fields, and as I walked over, they were talking about clothes. Wear what you would wear to a funeral, one reporter said his father, a preacher, had advised. He looked solemn and shiny in his clean, dark suit. I was back in my car, scrambling out of my blue jeans and into my black jeans, when two lights swept across me, the prison van, arriving to take us inside. In the prison entrance hall, steel bars spanned floor to ceiling, wall to wall. Beyond them, the prison slept, cold and bright, and pin dropped quiet. A guard with a gun checked my driver's license and press credentials. 
Then I passed through a metal detector and into a room where a prison matron told me to get my hands up over my head. She patted underneath my shirt, skin to skin. She took away my shoulder bag, car keys, and wallet, and handed me a yellow notepad and two pencils. I carried those down a linoleum corridor to a briefing room where tiny desks stood in tidy rows, like school. The prison spokesman was friendly and had a metal hook for a hand. Last meal, scrambled eggs, fried pepperoni, toasted Italian bread, two tomatoes, steamed broccoli, asparagus tips, strawberry shortcake with fresh strawberries and whipped cream, whole milk, and hot Lipton tea, he said. Yes, the governor was aware of the complexities of the condemned man's case, the innocence claim. No, the governor had not issued a stay. As the spokesman talked, a banging began, metal on metal like hammer on a pipe. The noise grew louder, clanging, clanking, a huge slamming sound, and the room blacked out. Standard procedure, the spokesman said through the gloom. For every electrocution, Florida State Prison switched to its own generator to make sure there was an uninterrupted flow of power, he explained. When the lights came back on, they were yellower, weaker. I made a note. These people know what they're doing. Then we got back in the van and rode around to the prison yard, rode around the prison yard to Q-Wing and the electric chair. Thank you. Your writing is so evocative. And this, this the moment where you chose to, to open the book is this incredibly emotionally charged moment for you. And, and the charge lasted for 30 years. Um, what was it like? returning to Florida as a detective, but also as a, as a writer, knowing that you had to tell your own story. And the other day, you and I were talking about the work that you do as a detective. Now, when I said, are you able to do things remotely given the pandemic? And you said, oh yeah, most of the work I do, I do remotely. But this case was different for you. It wasn't like other cases that you typically handle. Um, and you had to go back to, to the, the place where this crime occurred in person. Why was that? And what was that like? Um, really excellent questions. Um, the, the crime that's at the heart of the book, the thing I had to go back and investigate, was Jesse Tafaro was convicted of murdering two police officers on the side of the highway just north of Fort Lauderdale on a February morning in 1976. Um, he was asleep in a car along with his friend Walter Rhodes, his girlfriend Sonny Jacobs, and two young children. Two police officers, Trooper Philip Black and Constable Donald Irwin, knocked on the window and were murdered. Um, in, the, in the trial afterwards, Walter Rhodes testified against his friends, Jesse and Sonny. Jesse and Sonny said Walter did it. Walter said Jesse and Sonny did it. So Walter was a state's witness and he testified against them at trial. And then a year later, after the trial had sent them both to death row, he confessed to the murders himself, and then he recanted, and then he confessed, and then he recanted, and then he confessed. Um, in 1982, he landed on the, he made his final confession, and then he recanted it. And from then on, he said that he had testified truthfully. But obviously, there was a, um, a question of doubt as to whether Jesse Tafaro was an actually guilty man. Um, so I witnessed the execution, and it, um, it was a traumatic experience for me. And I ended up leaving journalism about two years later. And um, I moved to California and I ended up working as a private detective. And so about 25 years passed. And over those 25 years, I became very skilled at private investigation. And Jesse Tafaro became very famous as an innocent man. And I realized when I, would, I read a lot of stories about him in the press and um, he was the subject of a movie and a very, very beautifully written off Broadway play, very emotionally resonant story. And I realized that I didn't know what had actually happened and that I needed to know. Um, essentially because I think needing to know is just a quality that investigators have. And it's also a really important part of our, of our justice system, you know, based on um, telling the truth and, and finding out what actually happened. That's kind of the, the way that our system works. And so in 2015, um, I decided that I really did need to know this. Um, a number of, it just became something that I couldn't continue to live with that doubt. And so um, my husband and I came down to Florida for three months and I embarked on reinvestigating a crime. So it was a crime that had happened on the side of a highway 
in a long ago time in Florida, this happened in the 1970s, um, essentially before I-95 was even finished, Florida had changed a lot. Um, the, um, you know, going back in time is, is something that I have experience in, but it's not easy. So I needed to come down um, in person to do this. It's true, we do work remotely now a lot, but essentially when we really need to talk to people, we still have to get out to the doorsteps. It's just, it's the connection there. It's the ability for them to see me and for me to see them. Yeah, so, so many of the scenes in this book revolve around these extremely subtle dynamics between you and a person you've never met before and you, you, but you know so much about them already, you know? Um, it seems really important that you, you approach people in person and that's a, that, that for instance, you not do it over the phone. There's one scene in the book where you think, oh, I can call this person up and then actually it, it goes awry. You know, that ends up being the wrong choice. So uh, how did you learn these subtle dynamics? You know, how did you learn to get people to talk to you when they don't necessarily want to? I think, you. I think there's no, one of the things I say in the book is that the, the story that I ended up finding um, that I, you know, that I, I reinvestigated the case. It took me from Florida to Ireland to Australia. I spent a year immersed in it. Um, but really, there's no secret to it. It's, it's just reading the record and talking to people and then um, and listening to what they say. So one of the things that happened in, in this particular case is that people, um, I think we found that we shared a story which can happen in investigations sometime. It was a question of, I mean, we had all, many people who were connected with this case, the witnesses, the people who were involved in the crime, the, um, the police officers who had responded, um, the friends of the people who were involved. They'd all been watching and listening too, you know? So for 40 years for them, from 1976 until 2015, they had been wondering. And I showed up on the doorstep as somebody who was, you know, a, a trained professional investigator, but also who had personally witnessed mm -hmm. an aspect of the case. And I think that that was enough of a common ground that it was almost a relief um, for people. It was certainly a relief for me to be able to talk with people. You know, some of the things that happens in, in a case like this is that it has a common language that sort of only the people who know the case from the inside out or who've, who've lived it can speak. And it's a relief to find people who speak your language. And I think that's an aspect of, mm -hmm. of, of the investigation that was something that was the smallest to me and mm -hmm. to them as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, as in general, when I do investigations, one of the things that the people really do understand is that in our justice system, we rely on people telling the truth. I know there's there's this idea that truth is kind of you know, it's passe or we're, we're past it or it's all old school or whatever, but we really do rely on it, I think, in our own lives and certainly in the criminal justice system. And we as Americans really do understand that. And that there's an aspect, I think, that I tell people that the stories that we share that are important in cases like this, they belong to us, but they also belong to the larger cause of justice. And that I think we, we do understand that and people really do, um, sharing that that's a common ground that it's possible to talk to uh people about there were only two people who were really reluctant of all of the people that i spoke with and that's actually a pretty good return on on mm -hmm. investigation because i think it's something that that we had all been carrying with us and that we simply needed to discuss which isn't to say everyone agreed and it's not to say that i went looking for a certain story i really just wanted to hear what everybody had to say yeah, yeah. It seems as, it seems as though you genuinely like the people that you talk to in this story, even those whose relationship to the truth is um, questionable at best or dangerous at its worst. But nonetheless, you have a real warmth um, with these people. Even, I mean, at the end of the book, um, your your idea of Walter Rhodes has come so so far, and I, I don't want to give anything away, but. But it still seems as though you, um, I mean, at, at each moment as your mind changes about him each time, it seems as though you still really like him. And the reader does too, you know, um, or at least sees something, uh, 
I guess my question is, why do we draw close to these people? What is it about that fascinates us about them? You know, maybe you can describe some of the characters in this book. That's, it's really another really great question. Um, I do tend to really, in the moment when I'm interviewing somebody, I really do completely um, feel connected to them. And so I think that that's one of the things that, that informs my investigation work. Um, not necessarily that I like them, but that you know I'm very interested in the story that we're sharing. Um, though this this is a story that happened in Miami. In you know, the book is about the crime in 1976, and it's about my investigation in 2015. And it's very much about um, the journey that it took me on in my own life, which wasn't what I intended to write, but it is what the book turned into, sort of of necessity. But so it's a crime that happened in South Florida. It was in Miami and Fort Lauderdale in 1970s. And that's obviously a pretty resonant time. And it's um, a story that took me pretty quickly into a world of kind of amateur cocaine gangsters, which isn't what I had spe expected at all. You know, I just kind of stumbled into it. Um, There's a, a lot of jewel thieves. There was a, a Playboy bunny. Um, there's Murph the Surf. Who is the famous jewel thief who um, heisted the the um, American Museum of Natural History in 1964? He's quite a famous person. He recently died. Um, this is the brother of Mickey Rourke. And um, there's Don Pierce, who wrote Cool Hand Luke, which I had the pleasure of reading for the first time before talking to him. And it's just an incredibly brilliant book. Um, there's an internet channel over followers all over the globe, which was going to lead to the next dimension. And there's a former IRA power military <laughs> person. So it really was a lot of different people. And I think I didn't know any of that when I started out. And, and some of it was a little bit, um, it felt difficult for me to navigate. But I think the interest that people have in, you know, a lot of us, and I'm one of them, are just simply rural followers. You know, I pretty much I know what the rules are and I, I obey them. And then there are people who just simply don't, which are a lot of the people in the book. And that was something, I think it's interesting for people to see lives that, lives that do not follow the set of rules that we've, that we've been given and also to see how it plays out for people because it's not necessarily happy endings or, or good stories here, you know? And I think that's, that's of interest too. You know, a lot of times it's just, um, it's like the law of cause and effect, basically. And there's also a fascination with people who really do live outside the law, which is is a lot of what this story is about. Yeah, and so you've been you've been a private detective now for twenty years, right? Twenty five, yeah. 25. <laughs> and and there aren't well, so um when you're in situations like, for instance, when you're in a, a trailer in the woods in remote, was it Washington with Walter Rhodes and his wife? Extremely potentially dangerous people, no one around to hear you scream. What do you do as a woman in this line of work? You know, you put yourself in danger's way over and over and over. If something goes wrong, what's your first line of defense there? Is it your wit alone? <laughs> that would be. If that were true. That would be really interesting. Um, I think, I think um, actually, as a woman, I have an advantage, which is that I don't present as a threat. I mean, I'm not a threat, and I don't present as one. And so, it's possible for people to simply tell me to buzz off without having, you know, to feel like they really need to defend themselves. And I think that's that's an advantage. Um, and I also think that just the advantages of this gender in doing this work is that you know we present as um, just less intimidating you know, easier to get along with. And that as an investigator, when you're really trying to form a connection with somebody is really helpful. Um, and I think also, this is one of the things I realized I've been doing this work, which is getting, you know, getting on a plane or in a car and driving to people up to doors that I don't know and knocking on the doors and asking them questions for, as you said, 25 years. And I think by and large, and I continue to believe this is true, we have much more in common with each other than what separates us. And that and particularly, I think people, most people are not dangerous. Most people are not on the opposite side. Most people are, are not sort of instantly um, people to watch out for. And I think that's been an interesting experience realizing, realizing that. Um, I grew up in a very dangerous city in New York in the 1970s, and I was a victim of quite 
and it's, when I think back on it, kind of a lot of crime by the time I graduated from high school. Um, so I have a pretty good sense of danger, um, possibly overdeveloped now. Um, but I think also um, I use that common sense. I use my own judgment. And my first boss told me a couple of things. One is that as an investigator, you don't want to get let the witness get between you and the door. So you want to make sure that you are the door, you have an easy access to the door. So yeah. that's a little piece of common sense. And then the other thing is to essentially to be the person who is in control, which isn't to say that you're telling somebody what to say, but it is making sure that you understand what what the situation is that you're in and if it doesn't feel right to leave. So it's it's pretty basic. You know, I think that probably the job is not more dangerous for women than for men. And there's a huge advantage really in a lot of ways. But that being said, if I really don't feel like it's gonna work for me, then I have a cadre of retired FBI agents that I go with. So if I need somebody who has gone through life with a badge and a gun, not that they would necessarily be having either of those things along with me, who can really assert the authority and take over yeah, obviously, I'm going to go out with them if I feel like that's needed. And again, that's relying on my own judgment and experience. Yeah, yeah. You have to know when to call them back up. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. I wonder, you wrote, you've written so many passages in this book are kind of reflecting on your own, what you've learned about being a private detective. And you write so eloquently about it and your orientation to truth and honesty. And I, I wonder if you can, if you could, would agree to read a short passage about being a good detective, what it, it's on page 112. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> it starts with detective work is not just search and retrieval. Yeah, I wanna preface this really briefly with, I was trained in the San Francisco tradition, which is, um, it's kind of unique, I think, and possibly it's more common now, but back when I started, it was a tradition that came out in the 1940s, um, post-World War II, run by a guy named Hal Lipset, and it's the non-traditional detective. You know, we think of detectives as people who have been trained in the military or in the police, but in San Francisco, there's a school of us who come to the work from other pursuits. A lot of it's journalism, and, you know, sometimes it's just literally somebody's way of being in the world. And so that's what has informed me in my work. Um, you know, the, my former business partner, um, who's in the book, um, was an, just an incredible detective. And I think she's really an amazing investigator. And I think it was just how she is. You know, she just went through the world wanting to know and wanting to dig. And I think that's just possibly innate. And it's an interesting characteristic. It's not necessarily make you, doesn't make for an easy way through life necessarily, but it is um, something that I think can be pretty satisfying if you figure out how to use it to your, in your work. Um, so here I'm talking a little bit about how I came to work with my husband, Peter, who is another, he's a wonderful investigator and he's also not somebody who has a military or police background. It says detective work is not just search and retrieval. An algorithm can do that. Detective work is finding something you didn't know you were looking for. Pattern recognition with unknown unknowns. Freya's approach was blazingly exact. I hopscotch. That was a great combination, but we still sometimes got stumped. Over the years, we hired a lot of different people to work with us. A lawyer, a construction worker, a bartender, a journalist, a librarian, a brilliant medical student. And they were all great in different ways. But I came to believe that capacity for detective work has much more to do with how a person experiences the world than anything that it is possible to teach, aside from do not fuck up. And I think that <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's disorienting when I'm just seeing myself and I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, you know, when I see that in your work too, frankly, you know, the way that you've gone out into the world and um, and been able to connect with people, it's like the EM Forster only connect. I think that is the most important quality that a detective has because all the rest of it is, is tradecraft, which is possible to teach. But the I think the curiosity and the um, kind of generosity of spirit, the detectives that I know, um, have that, you know, they have the ability to to um, go through the world in a lot of different 
shapes with a certain transparency as well. You know, they don't insist necessarily on their own version of things. They're open to new ideas. They're interested in people. Mm -hmm. I'm shy. A lot of private detectives I know are shy, but some are not, you know, some just kind of will just barrel through life and they're interested in it. But I think you have to be um, kind of curious and a good listener and open yeah. and, you know, and, and, and the ability to step outside of yourself and connect, I think is probably key. I have two questions and the the first is about you and the second is about Peter. And uh, the first is how is it that you can be both shy and so bold as a detective? Um, well, because as a detective, I'm the detective. I'm not necessarily me. That was something that was hard about the book is because I was me, you know, I was going back into my own, I was investigating something that had a, that a direct connection to my own life. Mm -hmm. but, you know, otherwise it's, it really is just wanting to know what the facts are. And that's, that can be a tremendously motivating, very freeing force. I do have the, have had the sense really that truth is kind of a shield that if I'm out there asking for something that is, I'm there because I need the truth and I need to figure out what's going on. And, you know, in a, in a matter that I'm investigating, I feel like somehow that that's a magic shield. I know it isn't one and I'm adjusting my thinking about that, but it is where I have been um, carried through for really kind of a long time through a lot of different situations that you can't, you can't come after me because I'm just here, you know, I don't even have a, a side in this. I just really, really need to know what happened. It's kind of like, you know, like, oh, okay, sure. Then I'll talk to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and you say, actually, at the end of this paragraph, you say that uh, Peter's main strength is his honesty and transparency. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, but and you, but you also mentioned a generosity of spirit that, that private detectives all seem to have in common earlier. And I see that in the book and Peter's sort of insistence on accompanying you to all corners of the globe, even when you don't necessarily want him to, you know. <laughs> I mean, where do you find, where do you both find the kind of emotional capacity for this work? You know, um, the, what uh, keeps you going, I guess, even, I mean, because I know the truth is you have this burning need to know the truth, but also you're going all the way to Australia after Ireland, you know, and then back to Florida and no one has hired you to do this work. Right. Maybe, maybe my question is at what point did the book have its own sort of inertia? Did, did it possibly keep you going? even when you were exhausted, you need to finish I think Once I set out to find out, I knew that I needed to finish it. And that's just something that I do in all, all my cases. You know, um, I know that the, it does feel really wide ranging, the book, but it's actually, you know, I've worked on some cases for nine years. I'm sort of used to like the really long haul, really um, involved, really detail oriented investigations. And I'm used to getting out and talking to a lot of people. So this actually, one of the reasons that I felt it was going to be possible for me to try is that I'd done it in a million different ways before for at that point, 20 years. Um, and so I think that, um, it was the truth. Obviously that search was something that was personally important to me, but the, the, the skill set and the, um, kind of the resiliency and the doggedness just is part of the job. Um, I have a colleague named John Nardizzi. I worked with him many years ago and he's a friend of mine. And we were talking about it the other day. He's done work where he's worked with the New England Innocence Project and he's gotten um, two wrongful convictions reversed, one for a man who was in prison for 30 years and another for a man who was in prison for 40 years. Yeah. And so it's the same sort of work where you're really going back into the past and talking to people. Mm -hmm. And he described this kind of, um, it's just the sense of like a, like things coming together, like a kind of a, a golden moment when things fit, the puzzle pieces fit and you realize, oh, that's what it is. It's something that is, um, it's a really, really satisfying, um, interesting experience. And I think it's a way of making order of the universe, you know, in this kind of larger way to try to find the whys of something, to try to find the, the explanation, you know, and sometimes it's elusive, sometimes you don't find it, but the search for that, I think, is just simply part of our um, our experience of justice. And I think that's something that is really important to us, again, as, as Americans. It's um, the way that the, that the system works, is it fair? You know, these are sort of larger questions. And when you're working within the context of that, then you do keep going because it's something that just 
yeah. is necessary. It's not just for you, it's for mm -hmm. the world. And right. you were pursuing two different questions of truth in this book. There's the, the factual truth of what happened day in 1976, and then there's the, the truth of how it affected you, the sort of inner, pers the personal truth, right? Mm -hmm. And what's, what's your, do you wear two different hats as a detective and a writer? Well, it's because you started your career in investigation as a reporter and then left it for two decades and then came back to writing. Did you ever think that you would do that? And is it because you needed to hear something out about yourself? Um, I've sort of always been a writer, you know, I've just been the kind of person who just constantly writes, you know, no, no, if it's necessarily all that volitional. Um, and for years when I wrote, I was writing fiction, I wrote a novel, I wrote short stories and they were always about the death penalty, which, you know, is not necessarily a place that you want to spend a huge amount of time. And um, especially what? But you're working something out there. Yeah, it was. And I realized that it just, it's like the, the proverb, the obstacle is the path that I just was going to have to, if I was ever going to write anything that was not about the death penalty, I was going to have to address this mystery at the center of my own life. You know, I think possibly if I had left journalism and not become a private investigator with investigation and facts and truth and everything kind of at the center of my working life, I might not have framed my questions that way. I might have expressed them a different way, but because of because I did have this skill set and I had this mystery, I just ended up having to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, what was it like writing about your yourself so personally? It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're you're really good at writing about yourself. You do it very elegantly. You're very approachable. It's really interesting. You're really smart. I found it really, 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 really difficult because I literally like private investigator. The word is right there, private. And <laughs> I had spent 20 years. I've never been on social media. I've never wanted to appear to have any kind of opinion about anything. That's been really important mm -hmm. in my work. Mm -hmm. And so um, my initial um, my initial draft was really just the facts. And, you know, I do love writing about facts. And so I just was like, this is fantastic. It's like literally 650 pages long. And I've got every single fact you can possibly imagine. Um, but then I realized that it was it was missing a, a central narrative thread and that I realized I was going to have to do that. And that was really hard. I ended up, um, the book was ultimately, I think writing is therapeutic, literally. I think it helps you order your thoughts in a way that can be very, um, you know, uh, healing. But it took me on a journey through um, through trauma. And I hadn't realized that. And I do feel a little odd talking about it because I know that, you know, the witnessing that I did was was not in any way what other people have experienced with trauma. And I really want to honor that. It's not like I'm saying, you know, oh, it was so terrible for me and it's the same for everybody else. It's just continually revisiting this one terrible February morning in 1976 and then continually being back in the death chamber in May of 1990, as I was writing about it, um, I think it just it just became emotionally impossible for me at some point. And I ended up having a panic attack in the supermarket. And that's the thing that finally made me realize that I wasn't going to be able to just tough it out mm -hmm. three and a half years into the writing process. Mm -hmm. um, and I found a form of therapy called EMDR, which is eye movement. I can never remember the last two part of it, but they use the principles of REM sleep. Mm -hmm. it helps. It's a brain wiring issue. It's not an emotional processing issue, but it basically takes the live trauma that you keep stumbling into and it timestamps it and you can file it away. You know, it happened, mm -hmm. but you're not constantly stumbling into it and setting it off like a, like stumbling into a landmine, which is how it was feeling for me. Yeah. And so the combination of writing, of, of going through that EMDR and then, and writing about it is the thing that ultimately has been really, really helpful. I don't think that it would have been possible for me to process it without all the writing because writing, as you know, you're a writer is very helpful mm -hmm. um, in ways that I don't really, I can't possibly put into words, but it is. Um, it's very magical in a way, right? It's kind of yeah. like your brain talking back to you or something, or it's like two different parts of your brain. I, I, I don't know. It's this meta yeah. process of figuring yourself out. And it's, and the goal isn't necessarily 
make yourself look a certain way on the page either. It's just to be as honest as possible, you know? And there are moments in this book too, where you admit that you might've fucked up in this process or, you know, oops, I did, you know, or oh, I can't believe I said that, or, you know, or she's reading this article in front of me that I didn't want her to, or, you know, yeah. where you're, you know, where you're not necessarily flattering yourself too, you know? And I think that's part of the transparency that, that you were talking about earlier. That is really, really beautiful about, about this book, you know? Thank uh, you. Thank you. I do feel, I do feel kind of still embarrassed about that, actually. You know, I'd prefer it, I think, if I could have been, you know, sort of a more stereotypical detective and just keep it all. And, but I think also it is like a, a look at the, the costs that the work can take. And it's not just, obviously, it's not just private investigation, it's reporting, it's any kind of, of mem, you know, the memoirist yeah. work that you do as well. It's kind of like, you know, I think when you when you do really involve yourself, there is an emotional cost, and it's an interesting experience. It was a healing experience to write about, but it was it was not something that ultimately was particularly. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't. I, I sort of ended up having to do it. I'm I'm yeah. glad for it, but it's also something that that is it's still a little tricky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, now that it's there in the page, we can actually re reflect on it and understand it. You know, and it's beneficial for other people too to see. Oh, this. This 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 work is really messy and it's really personal and yeah. there's a huge risk involved and yeah so thank you so much for for doing all this um, thank you and I wanted to ask you too I want to make sure that I'm getting to oh actually as a as a part of kind of sub part of that conversation I wanted to talk about the effect that this writing has that writing all writing has on the on the world in the real world you know. Um, was that ever a concern for you writing this book? Oh my God, so many people are gonna read this and maybe be mad at me or you know, disagree with my the way I read this uh, the, these facts or or even you know the writing that you did back in, in 2003 or 1990 um, as a reporter. I think as a reporter it was easier because um, you know it's kind of built into the job. And, you know, if you're working for a newspaper, you don't really expect that people are necessarily going to like what they read. You just have to tell the truth. And that's the approach that I brought to the book. I really, really, really tried really hard to have, to just look at every piece, to, to keep all of my conclusions um, away as, as long as I could, to really let the evidence tell me what the story was, mm -hmm. to just tell me, have the facts tell the story. And so that was something that um, that took a lot of, of patience and discipline. It's something that that luckily I had some experience in with investigation because in investigation, there's always the other side of the case, you know, you're, you're working, but then there's the other side that's wanting to prove the other thing. And so you have to know, you have to be able to look at the case from a lot of different angles because you don't know what the argument's going to be in the courtroom. And so you really need to make sure that you can argue the other side too. And I really, really tried to do that going through here because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't setting out and sort of proving my own point. And there were definitely times going through it that I thought, oh, I, I changed my mind a lot as new evidence came up and I thought, oh, wow, okay. And I just tried to, in writing the book, I tried to really get that experience onto the page because I wanted it's, it's almost as if I wanted to get out of the way. I could talk about my emotions, but my, um, but I wanted the, the facts to speak for themselves. It's almost as though your emotions in the book are facts too, and your intuition guides you so much through this um, fact-finding experience. You, you just have a hunch and um, and you follow it, you know. Um, yeah. But it, and, but you're also tracking your sort of emotional investment in each version of the story. You know, you build relationships with the people that you're interviewing. You believe what they say. You think you have a relationship. And then when the story gets turned on its head, do you feel some grief over that? Oh, no, I thought I was almost there. And oh, no, I trusted this person. You know? um, I think um, because of my early experience as a reporter um, where I took Walter Rhodes at his word. Before the execution, I went and I interviewed Walter Rhodes in prison, and he told me a version of the crime that I, as a very inexperienced reporter, completely and totally believed. And then um, and then seeing the stories in the next two decades that were directly opposite to what he had told me, 
was was part of my conflict about the case, especially because when I was working for the Miami Herald, a very powerful newspaper, um, I felt as if, you know, possibly I had gotten in the way, you know, I had been part of the story in a way that I that I hadn't realized and hadn't known by writing the story that I did before Jesse Tafero's execution. And so since then, I've really, really tried to not let my personal um, take, you know, my impression, like the kind of like, oh, I could just tell. I've really tried not to do that. And um, and certainly in, you know, as an investigator, that's, you know, my impressions are part of my take on somebody, but they're not what I really rely on is what they say and how it matches the record. And so that's what I, um, that's what, that's how I went through this. But of course, you know, I do tend to, when I talk with somebody, I really do feel, I end up feeling connected to them, even if they're mean to me, you know, it's kind of like we've shared this moment. It's a pretty intense experience, um, you know, to appear on somebody's doorstep and talk to them about this thing that means something to them, that means something to me. It's, it, it is. Um, but I just ended up deciding that it was okay for me to tell the story as the facts dictated it, not as anybody else wanted it to be, including me. And so I just really tried to be rigorous about that. And um, not, not an easy thing to do. And I think it, it, it does happen. You know, people want you to tell a certain version of the story. Yeah. Yeah, and, it's so important not to promise you know, not to make promises as you're still, you know, oh, I've, or that you, you know, uh, I guess what I'm saying is how many people did you interview for this, uh, this, this case in total? Because at one point you talk about your, your method being just to talk to everyone, mm -hmm. um, gather every single version of the story. Right. I talked to everybody who had, who was still alive, who had been at the rest area that morning. Yeah. And I talked to most of the police officers who responded. Mm -hmm. I really tried to talk to every single person who had, you know, if you throw, a, like if you look at this crime as a as a pebble thrown into a body of water and the ripples go out, mm -hmm. I tried to go out as far as I could um, to talk with everybody who had direct knowledge. Not the people who, you know, a couple of ripples out, who've only heard what they've heard, but the people who were there. And just to try to, not to, take anybody's word for it, but just to kind of put all of the pieces together. But I think that, you know, every, people had really different opinions. They had really different yeah. memories. They had really different takes on things. And one of the things that um, in terms of investigation that we always do is to just get it all and then line it all up and see what it looks like. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously I would be, I would love it if everybody loved the book, but I just don't think that's that's a real possibility <laughs> that, you know, it's a really emotional, it's a yeah. really emotional thing for a lot of people still, and people have really strong opinions. Of course, yeah. I know that you, and mm -hmm. you were talking a bit about the, um, the mixed feelings of, of bringing this, these memories back to people's doorsteps at times, and you right. know, need to be sensitive to all the, the witnesses and their families, and or in the victim's families. You know. and I think that is really true, but I think we have to be a little bit careful with that thought. I mean, that's me saying, you know, um, it's just super hard to show up and say, look, I need to talk to you about something really difficult that happened that you know about that I need to hear about. Mm -hmm. um, it's always hard to do that. But the way that our justice system works is it works on the idea of being able to confront facts. It's just, it just does, you know, there's no way through it without being able to say to somebody, look, I know you're saying this, but I don't know if it's true and I need to know. I needed to know in this situation because I watched a man get catch on fire in the Florida's electric chair. You know, it was really a grisly experience. What happened to him was, was horrific. And then I read for 25 years or 20 years that he had been innocent. I needed to know that. I wrote a story that said three jolts used to execute killer. Mm -hmm. So three jolts used to execute innocent man is a totally different news story. Mm -hmm. I needed to know, had I, what did I see? I needed to know that for my own sort of spiritual personhood, you know, like mm -hmm. who am I? what has my life been? And so I think that the idea that there are, you know, questions that are too sensitive to ask somebody is is really not what investigation is based on. You know, we really, 
and in the way that our, our court and our justice system works, it's an adversarial process. You're allowed to quiz people about what they say because not everybody tells the truth, just how it is. And so if you need to, if there's a need to know, you know, that is a, um, that has to do with, with, with justice or resolution, I do feel like it is completely part of our system to ask the question. And I think it's it's actually really important to be able to do that and and to honor the search for what it is. Um, I want to ask you before we run out of time. I want to ask you a question about your writing too, because you you take you're a character in this book, and we often see you in, notes in your notebook and reading back over your notes. And even at one point, you hand your notebook to. Eric Jacobs, <laughs> and he's drawing a diagram in it for you. And mm -hmm. I mean, actually, in that moment, my heart was kind of uh, racing because my notebook, is, as a writer, like my notebook is sacred. Like I would never, <laughs> I would never give it to somebody. Maybe they'll run away with it, you know. But um, but I, but the no and the notebook for me, for every for all artists of all stripes, is is a really fascinating object and just how people use it. It's like an extension of your body, kind of. Yeah. Talk about your relationship with your notebook as a writer and an investigator. Like, what kind of details are you writing down, you know, <laughs> when you're wearing one hat versus the other? This is such a great question. Yes, I do feel that way about the notebook. Too. Just, no, I, I truly do not want anybody to. But I often, as an investigator, so it's different. As an investigator, you know, my notes are my record of the case. And so I feel like it's, it belongs to the case, not to me, you know? just in the same way that people's stories, you know, that I'm going to ask them for, they belong to them, but they also belong kind of to the, the larger cause of truth and justice. And so, um, so my, like my own personal notebook, you would have to really pry out of my hands, but a case notebook, it's very helpful sometimes to ask somebody to please draw it for me. Because I asked, um, I asked uh, Robert McKenzie, the eyewitness, yeah. I, did, I asked Eric, um, I asked Walter Rhodes. Um, you know, I sat with Carl Lord, who did the polygraph. That's one of the issues in the case, and he he drew on it with me. You know, there's kind of a a connection there. It's also an interesting experience too, because a lot of the investigation goes back through time. I describe it in the book as yeah, time travel. travel. And so documents, of course, are like one of my absolute favorite forms of time travel because you see them and you realize this is something that was created in 1976 and I'm holding it right now. You know, yeah. there's kind of something that is beyond my powers to describe of why that's interesting to me. So creating a document from a case, like a case notebook that's separate from a personal notebook, um, it, it does the same thing. And then, you know, so I have my notebooks and I can I can look back through them and it's like, oh, okay, that's that's kind of the evidence that I was there. Right that point right, right yeah and so that's but as you were writing this book were you also carrying a separate notebook that was personal where you were writing down the details of Sonny Jacobs's kitchen or you know things like that or the, the cigarette burning outside you know in the ashtray outside the duplex <laughs> yeah it's like a, a it's, again it's again my investigation practice is is to one of the things that um I was taught very early on in terms of documenting um what people tell you is is to write down where you met them and what the physical environment is and it's it's essentially it's a way to help your own memory yeah. and it's a way to kind of um be able to prove that you were there and so i do keep a separate notebook of of impressions and just notes to self because i think that those are a record that's that's you know sort of an internal for example like a an internal stream of the case that belongs that yeah. belongs to you that you can always um, you know sort of step into as needed and it's it continues on you know and it changes it's never the same and so I think that that's something that um, is you know you see it you honestly you see it quite a bit in detective fiction as well like the really physical descriptions of a place and that has to do with the just the basics of detective work itself which is to be able to say yeah I was there the house was yellow you know if somebody says you never came to my kitchen this is my boss's old my old boss's example you say well do you have a collection of you know coke cans from the 1930s and they say yes and so how did you know that you know and so I, it's, it's it kind of goes to credibility as well but it very much goes to 
being able to document and uh, refresh your own memory. So you must have an iron trap memory. You never forget anything. I do have a really good memory for cases, but everything else, yeah, no. Like yeah. I can read books twice and not know, but like <laughs> case facts do stick in my head. Yeah. That's so interesting because um, my partner and I always joke about how I have no memory for movie titles or who directed them or who the actresses were in the movies. But books, I remember the author and five of their titles and, you know, yeah. it's just weird. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really interesting. Yeah. Like specific how that works, definitely. You have a selective and emotional memory. <laughs> Sounds that way. Oh my God, what a fascinating conversation. It was, really. Sarah. Yeah. Oh my God, thank you so much, Sarah. You were a wonderful moderator, just a wonderful moderator. Well, I, I think, I feel fun. like you really like did some your, some of your own detective work definitely. on the book, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> So we have a couple of questions from the audience, if it's okay. There's one that's for both of you. Um, and someone would like to know, Pam would like to know, what are the different challenges and joys of writing fiction versus nonfiction? Mm. Ellen, you take this one. I think that's really a question for you, as you are the experienced fiction writer and nonfiction. But you were just talking about writing a novel, which I'm now so curious about. Well, yeah, so I didn't say I finished it, just, you know. Yeah. Well, me too. I have some that I'm still working on like 15 years later. I mean, I think with a novel, um, well, maybe like with, with a nonfiction, with a story that's nonfiction, for me anyway, and kind of Ellen, what you were talking about, the facts really dictate the story. You know, mm -hmm. the truth that I'm looking for in nonfiction sometimes is, is just a factual truth, you know, but um, I think when I write a personal essay, it's more similar to to my emotional experience when I'm writing fiction, which is like the truth that I'm looking for is much more nebulous, you know? Um, something that can't really be described with words, but can only be shown with like images and symbols, metaphors, mm. you know? That's kind of my experience of it, I don't know. What about you? Why did you have to write the novel first before you could write the memoir? Oh, I think I, um, I didn't dare get into the investigation of the case, but I wanted to explore the emotional aspects of it. Mm. Yeah. So it was easier to do it that way, although I don't think it was successful because I think I was trying to to work out a factual resolution sort of by thinking about it. And I realized I had to actually go and investigate it. Yeah. Wow. Like, it's like you had to grow into the book you needed to write. Kind of. Exactly. Yeah. Do you think you'll finish the novel now? No, I think I'm done with the story, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and um, actually, I'm sure it was like kind of a relief, right? Yeah, I want to move on from the death penalty. Finally done with it. I don't know if either one of you have ever read um, The Art of the Memoir by Mary Carr, mm -hmm. but yeah. she talks a lot about like, you know, how difficult it is to write memoir. And I, and I thought it was really interesting, Sarah, to hear you say that it's also difficult for you, that it's oh, yeah. not, an, not an easy process at all, because you can get sick from actually remembering some things. Right. Um, also fascinating to hear about the EMDR therapy. I've been reading about that. That sounds amazing. It is amazing. Um, so I'm glad it was helpful for you. Yeah. Um, here's another question. Um, Max would like to know, um, Ellen, since the book came out, have you heard from any of the witnesses or participants who are prominent in the book? If so, what has been their reaction? Um, the only person I've heard from is um, the the uh, widow of, of Trooper Black. And it was really great. I don't want to share what she said. It just meant a huge amount to me. I'm really, really grateful. Great. I felt a little emotional just now hearing that too. And then maybe we'll just do one more um, from Caroline. Uh, Ellen, can you talk about your time at the Herald and your relationship with journalism and how that influenced you as a writer? And I feel that you already touched on that a lot, but maybe there's something you'd like to add. Yeah, I love to the Herald. It was just the most amazing three and a half years of my life. Um, I started in Miami in um, the uh, South Miami Bureau of Neighbors, and then I went to Palm Beach and I went up to Tallahassee. And it's just such an, an incredible thing that I will always treasure is working for the Herald during in the late 
late 1980s and you know obviously i left in the early 1990s it was just an amazing time to be a newspaper person in florida and obviously journalism training is incredible training for so many things in life including investigation there's a lot of really great um investigators who trained as journalists because you know you learn to be accurate and you can write fast and um you get an understanding that it's okay to ask questions to go through the world as somebody who you know and i think that's really helpful to know I was really fascinated when you said that detectives don't insist on their own version of things. Um, and I, I love, I, it feels like maybe for many years you kind of erased yourself in a way from scenarios and now you have to like reveal yourself yes. a little bit. So <laughs> that's, yeah, that's really, really interesting. So we're top of the hour okay wow. um, i just i know it's gone so Goodbye. fast it was this was a really kind of not only fascinating but very profound conversation about so many aspects of life and of writing um thank you so much to everyone that has joined us um during the lunch hour here with us at books and books thank you for being with us in our little virtual bookshop i hope that we're going to get to see you both in person soon so. Um, okay. And uh, I just want to remind everyone watching that if you don't already have your copy of the book, you can order it. Hey, there it is. Perfect. Uh, by pressing the green button at the bottom of the screen and we'll ship it right out to you. And if you're in Miami and you want to pass by any of our stores and grab a copy, we have them at all of our stores, too. Um, and then just thank you both for joining us. And, thank you so much. Thank you, um, thank you so much. So much for this book. And thank you, Sarah. Amazing questions. Yeah, really nice incredible conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye. Bye.